After patch 1.5 came out for Victoria 3, a lot of things have changed with the way that your armies are. There's a new warfare and army composition system in place and a lot of new features that we're going to be discussing today because I finally cracked after you guys asked me in the comment section so many times, Lud, you do a warfare and army composition video like you do for you 4 Okay, sure, let's do it and tell you what, if we get 6,000 likes on this video, I'm going to do an economic video as well where I explain in detail the basics all the way to the more advanced features to get you started on your Viki 3 adventures. Now the new military system we have, we have three tabs here. We got the army tab, navy tab, and mobilization tab. First let's talk about the army tab. To create an army you just go to create army then you select your home HQ which can be changed after you've uh, spawned in the army of course. Same goes for the navies, exactly the same actually. Only difference is you obviously cannot create navies in uh, HQs that are within uh, land and have no access to the sea of course. Now let's go over to one of our armies here. I personally, before anything else, like to click the edit and I like to edit my troops and better yet my army groups so that I know what exactly they do. So I put this flag pattern with a specific color and then I go to state as well and rename it first imperial army or whatever. You can do whatever you want. I recommend you do something of the sorts because it's easier to know where that unit is located if you set it as state. So whenever you want to disband that unit, you know which state state it belongs to, which state will lose that barrack that has that specific unit. If you put a culture, it's going to be significantly harder to find what state it is. You would literally have to click every state individually, which is not the case if you just do it like this, right? Now we confirm and I'll do the same for the other armies. So now that that's done, why did I do here different icons for this army? Well, because I like to have different types of armies. I like to have one type of army as my main overall standard unit that I'm going to be using in warfare. Then I like to have one artillery heavy army that is going to deal more damage and that I can assign whenever I'm pushing the enemy front and then I also like to have a smaller army that is usually just like 5 infantry or 10 infantry 5 cavalry something of the sorts that I can easily use to do naval invasions or I can do some quick maneuvers around the battlefield that I don't necessarily need a lot of units for because it usually is not fighting an enemy big army but that's just my opinion of course and of course the one ship get cool because weird that Prussia has only one ship but that's just me they should definitely have at least five ships. Come on, man. Now that we got that out of the way, let's click on the army itself. So right now, we start as the Prussians with skirmisher infantry, mobile artillery, and lancers. There's different actual types of military units. So if you click on these, you see cavalry usually has four different tiers. You will have all four of these tiers available from the get-go. The difference is that if you're playing as a smaller nation, you likely want to keep it on hussars, dragoons, or cuirassiers, depending on what kind of trade goods you have available. The difference between these is of course Hussars deal a lot less damage, offense and defense a lot less than the Lancers which have more almost triple that plus they have battle occupation, kill rate percentage but look at this. They also cost two iron, two grain, two small arms. The cost of this lowers with the earlier type of unit but also the stats lower. So Hussars only cost one grain input but they have horrible stats right? So even if you can upgrade to Lancers only do it if you're actually actually able to support and pay for the upkeep of this particular unit. That is a very important thing to keep in mind when you play VQ3. Because just because you can have Lancers doesn't mean you should have Lancer. You know what I mean? Same goes for the artillery. You might have uh, cannon artillery or you might have mobile artillery. Not everybody starts with the uh, mobile artillery. Mobile artillery and the rest need to be researched. Same goes here. Line infantry and all the way to mechanize need to be researched. You don't start with the uh, line or skirmishers. A lot of countries start with sk skirmishers but that's usually the great powers like Prussia starts with them I think the French start the British start with them so the big boys essentially usually start with the skirmishers same thing goes here the skirmisher units do have a higher upkeep one ammunition and two small arms the line infantry only have the one small arms and the irregulars have no upkeep so you technically could have an army with zero upkeep as long as they are just irregular units which is kind of the case that uh, the great Qing have they basically have irregulars with a couple of uh, I think dragoons on the side if I'm not mistaken maybe hussars I'm not sure the difference between these is massive like look at this just between irregulars and uh, line infantry is double for the offense and 150% increase for the defense and then for skirmishers not so much only five extra offense and 10 extra defense it gets much better as you go along of course with the latest mechanized uh, infantry will have 50 offense 60 defense and 10% devastation but the cost increases so much however by that point of the campaign when you're 
you're gonna have these type of units you will be more than able to support these units of course and the reality is that late game you kind of want to have a big army so you have a lot of upkeep for this big army so in turn you have a lot of demand for those particular trade goods kind of like a closed loop where having a lot of troops with a lot of demand equals a lot of need for certain goods to be produced which in turn means you make a lot of money so now that being said what is the optimal army composition in uh, victoria 3 essentially you want to have less artillery and cavalry combined than you have infantry and now the amount depends on the size of the country and the amount of money that you can actually sustain an army for so say for example as the prussians in 1840 will be able to get 50 infantry per army with 30 artillery and 10 cavalry even 40 artillery is not bad since artillery has extra damage compared to your infantry units so say you have uh, skirmisher units which have 25 offense but the mobile artillery has 30 offense and this is the thing that matters right because in the combat phases they take two stats and two stats only they take offense and defense so the higher the offense you have the more damage you deal the higher defense you have the easier it is to defend and uh, prevent the enemy from capturing your positions right now there's also kill rate that artillery have which is 20% so that's pretty massive that increases of course 30% with shrapnel and then it kind of goes down a little bit 25 and stays at 25 with the last two but the point is that artillery is really good so why do we even need cavalry you still need some cavalry for this thing here alone battle occupation five ten cavalry units should be enough in my opinion no matter what size the army is because they have a pretty high upkeep considering that they only have five percent kill rate and the offense defense stats are basically the same like the infantry the only thing that you kind of get from the your cavalry is the battle occupation now as you progress and we'll talk about this in a few moments when it comes to mobilization you can get battle occupation from some mobilization uh, pms so that's kind of going to make uh, cavalry not so efficient anymore but still you want to have five to ten lancers or their upgraded uh, light tanks pretty much till the end of the campaign artillery as long as it's less than infantry you're gucci doesn't matter how much you have just has to be less than infantry combined with cavalry so if you really want to max out you could have 50 infantry 40 artillery and 5 or 10 cavalry and that should be a good composition if you have more artillery and cavalry combined then you're going to get organization debuff and now that we talked about the army composition let's talk about the particular stats in the top here because these are really important to know about organization essentially determines the effectiveness of your units you can have lowered or debuffs for organization if you have more special units than your infantry so that means if you have more artillery cavalry or if you have less generals than your command limit so we have right now 30 battalions in this army right and our leader has a command limit of 50 if we say had this army and we had we fired this guy here retire commander we have no general that means we have 40 units and zero command limit so from having zero command limit if we on pause it's going to lower our organization down to 25 percent and that's going to give some debuffs 25 percent lower defense 10 percent lower defense recovery rate by 50 percent lowered and morale recovery by 100 which essentially means this unit is useless this unit is not going to be able to fight or maintain any sort of combat situation for any sort of time so we need to make sure we have our command limit up make sure we have the amount of generals required one general at level one is going to give you 30 command limit that means you can have up to 30 units in that particular army with one general two generals is going to give 60 and so on when you have four generals which is the maximum amount of generals you can have you get 120 but then you can also upgrade general remember that hiring a general costs you minus 10 flat bureaucracy but promoting a general is only going to cost five bureaucracy and promoting a general also gives you 30 command limit the same as if you were to recruit a secondary general for level two then for level three it's 20 command limit 45 command limit afterwards and the last one is going to be 75 command limit so if we were to fire all of these other guys here with just one level five general which is a field marshal we can have up to 200 units so four field marshals in an army equal 800 command limit so you could have one army with 800 units in it which of course is probably going to happen in the late part of the campaign especially in multiplayers right if you're playing with friends one thing to keep note is that the higher the level of your general the higher the interest group political strength so this guy here he's a part of the Junkers interest group which are essentially political parties like they're not technically political parties they become political parties later down the line but interest groups represent your population let's say and this guy being a part of the Junkers gives the Junkers 20% political strength which is a huge amount so if we hover over these guys here we can 
can see that from a Karl Friedrich Zudochna Schlobitten, the field marshal we just promoted, they got an extra 20% of their political strength. So this is also a way if you want to promote a specific party, say you want to promote the armed forces or you want to promote the industrialists or whatever, you can recruit a general that is from that particular interest group and you can promote him. And once he's level five, he's going to give you a maximum of uh, 20 political strength. As such, you can see that reflected in the clout of that particular interest group. Okay, I was actually talking about organization. So let's go back to talking about organization. <laughs> now that uh, we have the uh, command limit, our organization is going to fix itself, but it's not instant. It takes time. So we have to wait a few weeks until it goes back up to 100. And then we don't have these debuffs anymore. They lower the debuffs, the more the organization is, right? Some other important stats here, of course, are your offense, defense. This is the value that they take when they attack and when they defend a specific position with this particular army. This can be increased or decreased based on the units that you have. So if you were to have irregulars, that would uh, lower the offense and the defense. But take note, you cannot demote units that are skirmishers to irregulars. So you can go up, you can promote irregulars to skirmishers by clicking this button here, upgrade, but you cannot demote. So in our case here, we have to keep it as skirmishers because we cannot demote these guys to irregulars. Same goes for the artillery and for everything else, for the cavalry as well. If you want to say make these guys hussars, you cannot just go ahead and make them hussars. You have to keep them as lancers if they already are a higher tier unit. Your manpower is pretty self-explanatory. This is the amount that uh, the army can have as a maximum. Essentially 1,000 units equals one brigade or battalion, whatever you want to call it. Another extremely important stat is the morale. Now the morale essentially is how long the unit's going to be in the fight. When the morale reaches zero, the unit retreats. So you lose the battle. So you want to make sure you, that your morale is obviously going to be more or stay higher than the enemy army's morale during your combats. If you lose your morale, you recover your morale steadily after the battle. If you have obviously the resources or better yet, supply essentially determines how fast you will be recovering your morale. This is also the upkeep of uh, this particular army. And take note, the uh, manpower recovery is really dependent, of course, on your production method. So you most of the time start with no organization, no organized training, which is the default production method. And then after you get new technologies, you will be unlocking better production methods for this. And that means you can recruit units faster. Training rate is increased as such. You can recover units a lot faster when you've lost them during combat or after you've just recruited them during peacetime. You can also go over here and click on each unit and then you can see exactly which state that unit is recruited from. So if you wanted to disband the barrack in that particular state, you can just click here, boom, and it disbanded the barrack in that particular state. That means the people that were a part of this particular army are now back in the uh, pool so they can be hired to do another job that is required in that particular state. But this is because remember, we edited this and we made it so that it shows the state, not the culture. Otherwise, you have to hover over each unit individually to see where the barracks is located or you can click on the state itself, which is a pain. So don't do that. Now, another thing to take note, you can click on each unit individually and it's going to tell you based on the barracks in that particular state, what units belong to that particular barracks, the upkeep for all of those units and the production method when it comes to training. So you could individually change this if you wanted to have no organized training, but then for the rest of the army, you want to have it as general training. You could do that. I don't recommend that though. I recommend you keep it all at the same production method. So you do it, standardize it from here, from your development tab, instead of doing it individually, because you might forget. And there's just really no point to it really. Now let's talk a little bit about generals. Although I think I've already mentioned most of the things generals, you can have up to four in your army and they each have a specific interest group, but that's not it. There's more to it. So you see each general has their own individual ideology aside the interest group and as well, they have their own character traits. The character traits actually determine as a commander, what type of orders they might have available as well as what type of uh, bonuses they might have. So here, for example, because he's romantic, he's going to have less offense by 10% and morale loss by 10% as well. And because he's a defensive strategist, he has a unique order that you unlock whenever you recruit him. That being said, he's also a royalist. So that means if he's ever going to be in charge of an interest group, which you can also make generals in charge of an interest group, I'll show you in a second how, he will be strongly endorsing monarchies and opposing council republics and any sort of uh, democracy or theology, or theocracy better yet. So let's recruit him. Now, as you know, you can promote him and that's going to lower the bureaucracy, increase 
increase the command limit, it's also going to increase the political strength. Plus, we can issue specific orders for each general. Right now, there's 12 different types of orders, 5 defensive types and 7 offensive types. And these are based off of skills. There's default ones, advance and defend, which is 10% defense bonus or 10% offense bonus and 5 general advancement speed. These are the default ones in case they don't have any traits, these particular generals. But this guy, he has a trait. So he can do adamant defense, which offers 15% defense bonus, much more than the uh, standard by 5%, and dug in chance plus 100%. However, it does also increase the supply consumption by 20%. So if you don't have a strong economy to sustain whatever supply is required for that particular army, it can be a little bit painful. In the later part of the campaign, this is actually very beneficial because higher supply from your armies, as far as I'm concerned, means a higher demand for that particular good. So the more factories you have building that particular good, the more money you make out of it, right? I'm not going to go through each of these, obviously, individually. There's a lot of different ones. Some of them are really good, like Cautious Advance is probably my favorite one because it has less advancement speed, but it has minus 5% morale loss, recovery rate plus 10%, and Careful Maneuver chance plus 50%. Careful Maneuver is one of the maneuvers that the generals can have during combat. We'll go into that in a few moments when we actually show the combat. Generally, it is preferred to hire generals that have these kind of traits as they can be pretty good during combat, so keep an eye out for them. Now, let's recruit this guy here for a second, right? So we got this guy who's a, a part of the Petite Bourgeoisie. Let's promote him up to level 5. And the Petite Bourgeoisie right now is ruled by this guy who is a royalist, right? And he's disliked. Now, this general that we just recruited, which I also forgot where I put. Where Where is he? <laughs> okay, it's this guy. All right, he's a Democrat, right? So if he was to become the leader of that particular interest group, he's not a royalist. So he's going to be supporting certain legislation to pass. So he's going to support universal suffrage, landed voting, all that to pass. He's also going to support elected bureaucrats, basically highlighted over there. Now, in order to get him elected, the, he's got a higher chance of getting elected if he's got uh, more popularity, if he is a higher rank in the army and so on. It's not a guarantee, but it, it basically has a percentage chance. So let's say we fire this guy. Oh, there you go. He got hired and he's a Democrat. So if we uh, say reform and we get these guys in charge of the country, maybe put a few more in there, we might be able to do certain legislation. There you go. We can. We can do universal suffrage because of him having this particular endorsement here. There you go. Hans Karl von Zieten, 8.9 endorsement for universal suffrage since he is a Democrat. That's a good way of uh, using your generals, which is an RNG feature, right? Using them up to uh, pass legislation that can be helpful in the long run. And I know this is not a uh, legislation guide, but you get my point. Remember earlier we were talking about maneuvers? Well, these are the maneuvers here. This guy's got panic retreat, which gives a minus uh, or plus 50 morale loss and minus 50 recovery rate. This guy's got Pursuit, a 1,000 combat width, and minus 100% morale loss. These are maneuvers, right? And there's a percentage chance for each general to roll out a different maneuver during the phases of combat. And now, since we do have the combat screen up here, we also see that we have 59 offense. Now, the offense of the attacking battalions is 59 on average. The highest offense in the world is 72. Defense of the defending uh, battalions is 42. That is the average of their defense. And you can see here a few more stats, the amount of dead, wounded, demoralized. This, of course, more dead, more wounded, and demoralized is going to make it so your army is going to lose a lot faster. There's a few things here. You can go to each army and you can see the uh, balance for that particular army. And that is because that army is consuming a lot of different goods. So this is the army in one particular HU and the North China HQ, which we already have 100 maxed out battalions on this one. And these 100 battalions take up 66,000. Now, all of these goods here here are being produced by us so them consuming so much is actually not so bad i'm going to talk about that more right now let's go over to the mobilization tab now the mobilization tab has a lot of different things here it might be a little bit scary at first but don't be too worried about it let's go down to an army that doesn't have anything so there you go let's go to the imperial army 8 right so they have the basic supplies which cost 0.5 grain input and 25 percent more input of the other goods now say this army does not have any actual tank radio oil input that means that it doesn't get the 25 percent it only applies the 25 percent obviously if there already is a an established demand for that particular good so say we have for the eighth imperial army which we need to promote one of these guys there you go we have trench infantry right now the trench infantrymen actually don't uh, require any radios so we would only be getting a 25 increase on small arms ammunition artillery and so on let's go back to the mobile mobilization tab you could 
either individually assign these mobilization orders or production methods to each army individually from this tab or military mobilization. It's a lot easier like this in my opinion. It gives you an overview of what exactly has been enabled, what exactly has not been enabled for that particular army. So the difference is basic supplies you have to do anyway. You cannot deactivate, right? If you do, if you, It's going to be there forever. But you can give extra supplies and that's going to give 10% extra offense and defense and morale loss reduction but it costs groceries as such increasing the demand of groceries on your market you can give luxurious supplies it's going to give an extra 10 percent offense and defense and minus five morale loss again it's going to cost certain things and it's going to increase a percentage for all the other goods that it already is consuming supplements essentially are sugar tobacco liquor and opium and all of them give a flat 10 percent morale recovery so you can have up to plus 40 percent morale recovery from giving all four of these if you're a big nation that basically has half the planet like we have over here in my russia campaign then this is a no-brainer you have a lot of all of those i probably have like 500 of each of those plantations so it's really not so any sort of an issue to give this out but if you don't have it of course do not give it out you don't want to crash your economy <laughs> you know you got to be careful you got to mind what you have in your own country first off now the transportation orders are really interesting because we start with the forced march which offers formation speed plus 10 percent and formation mobilization plus 25 percent but it takes away 10 percent morale loss inflicted which is a pretty big deal i personally don't think this is worth it in most cases unless you're you know not worried about losing morale because you have an already massive army so it's not gonna make any difference truck transport offers 30 percent formation speed meaning your units move a lot faster but it does cost automobiles and unfortunately automobiles can be pretty expensive right now let me show you in my particular market i'm not even producing that many automobiles because rubber is my biggest enemy here i have some rubber companies i am fourth producer in the world which is not that impressive let's be honest and my main issue is just that i didn't rush for the colonies in africa as fast as i probably should have in this particular run because rubber limits the amount of um everything you have in the late campaign so you want to rush for indonesia you want to rush for south india south america and africa to get as much rubber as possible and as such if you don't have the rubber you don't have an excess of automobiles i don't recommend you give this out engines on the other hand give a flat 20 percent formation speed and that's it they don't give any mobilization speed they don't have any debuff and if you have a lot of engines go ahead and give this out but again you need to make sure you have a good supply of engines right now i'm the world's leading producer of engines with 26,000 being produced the second after me is the brits with 2,000, and i still have a negative look at that oh no actually i just uh okay i don't have a negative anymore i have 26.4 and 26 fine i had a negative up until a few moments ago never mind so because we don't have a negative we can give out the um rail transport which cost the one extra engines or 0.5 engines now medical support here gives 20 percent recovery rate it costs liquor and fabric so you can give it out or field hospitals doubles that with 40 percent but here's the kicker if you've activated medical support turning it off reduces the morale by 50 percent and the organization by 20 percent from a mobilized army so make sure your army is not at war make sure you're at peace when you do that change or make sure it's not fighting because if you click here and then you turn it off and you do it a few times as well there you go we went down to 12 morale and 33 organization for that army because it keeps scaling up like that right so if you were fighting with this army you'd have no morale no organization you would be losing whatever you engagement you might be doing so make sure you don't do that you activate this you can keep it activated during peacetime or whenever that army is not fighting and now reconnaissance here is going to be available when you have um the technology researched gives battle occupation plus 50 percent formation speed plus 30 percent surprise maneuvers plus 50 percent i personally think this is absolutely vital you need to give this out but you cannot afford to give this out to every single one of your armies because this is super super expensive like i said before automobiles are going to be an issue unless you are just ridiculously filthy rich when it comes to rubber which likely is not going to be the case so you want to have say one army that has this activated when they're doing advancements when they're attacking and they're trying to take land from the enemy and remember turning this off lowers the organization by 50 percent again so we went down 12 percent in our case if we had 100 percent, we'd go down to 50 percent same goes for aerial reconnaissance i love this one airplanes are not that bad compared to automobiles so whenever you do have aerial reconnaissance which is going to be likely in the very late campaign you want to activate this doubles the battle occupation doubles the rapid advance chance and lowers loss chance 
by 50%. So it's pretty good. Oil shouldn't be an issue. In most cases, you will have a lot of oil by the time that you have this particular reconnaissance uh, mobilization order activated. Now, the last ones here, support equipment, whenever you have them research, is just a flat amount. It's actually pretty decent. You should have all of these activated if you have the uh, technology. I don't have the tech for any of them yet, but they give 5 offense, 10 defense for the machine guns, 20% offense, 50% kill rate for the chemical weapons, recovery rate minus 20%, however, and it costs only fertilizers, which is really good. And we also have the flamethrowers, 15 offense and 10% uh, morale damage, and again, 50% devastation, and it only costs oil. So all of them you want to get. If you rush for these, honestly, you're probably going to win most engagements in the mid to late campaign. I would say against normal AI, you don't need to worry as much, but if you're playing in a multiplayer, you probably want to rush for these. I'm also going to talk a little bit about your navies. There's three types of units for your navies. You have the uh, light ships, capital ships, and support vessels. The support vessels are the submarines and the carriers. Honestly, the submarines and carriers are absolutely insanely good. Whenever you unlock them, you want to spam a few of these because these are going to be vital in combat. But take note, they can be kind of pricey and you want to make sure that your organization is the same like with the, with the armies. You want to have more light ships than you have capital ships with support vessels combined. Also to take note is that the different types of units that you have here, a lot of the times you cannot upgrade from them, right? So if you have torpedo boats, you can only upgrade to scout cruisers. You cannot upgrade to monitors or to destroyers. Basically the same like um, like with the infantry, with the army units. You the orders for the admirals are slightly different. You have more specific orders here, like you have uh, raiding efficiency, convoy protection, interception chance, and everything else. So navies are fairly straightforward in my opinion. You either click here and you do a naval invasion somewhere, you might be able to do a naval invasion. You deploy to a sea node and then when that navy is in that particular sea node, it's either going to protect in that sea node your traffic, protect from naval enemy navies trying to invade or enemy navies trying to raid your convoy. And you can also do the uh, set uh, station in HQ, which essentially just stations it and doesn't do anything in a particular HQ. I prefer to have them out in the uh, sea, usually at nodes to protect specific trade convoys. And of course, move them around based on whenever you need them, wherever you need them during combat. The stats at the top exactly the same like with armies you show your buildings here where the navies are originally from modifiers you don't have unique uh, mobilization orders as you have with the uh, armies unfortunately for the navies now when it comes to strategies i set up a little bit of a first world war here against the austro-hungarians and we've got almost the same amount of units 1.1 thousand against 1.1 thousand or 1.2 thousand anyway so essentially we've got the same units we've got the same technology as well also screw you romanians ungrateful scumbags actually joining the Austrians. I've helped you this entire freaking run, bro. What? I hate you. Oh my god. Seriously. I'm gonna I'm gonna remember this, you scumbags. Anyway, my point is that during these kind of massive engagements, your main enemy is gonna be attrition. Look at this. We already just started the war and we have 100,000 dead. 94 of them are our troops due to attrition. That sucks. We haven't even fought yet, boys. That's a lot of population right there. In most cases, you really want the enemy to be pushing you so that you have a defensive battle which is a lot easier to uh, repel. Once you've repelled the battle, you go from having your units on uh, defense to start advancing. If you don't want to have everybody in advance on the same time, you can get some of the uh, special advance uh, soldier generals. So you could have, say, pillage as your uh, attack order if you just want to deal as much damage to the enemy as possible or cautious advance, which is a slower advance, but you have some recovery rate morale loss like I showed earlier, which is really not bad it kind of helps out quite a bit. If you have two generals in the same army on cautious advance, that's even double whammy as they say in Russia. Now, if you have a lot of puppets, unfortunately, it will happen that your puppets are going to just send their bodies and they're going to die a lot in stupid battles that they're not going to win, but they're still going to attack. So keep that in mind. You might need to um, integrate some nations before you do a lot of the big wars, especially. But there you have it. Our own units, we have 52 offense, whilst they have 62 defense, which means we're losing units here so we need to make sure that our units have all the freaking support oh okay that's one of the issues we need more organization let's go one of this guys upgraded now we're gonna go up to 100 organization so we can stop the attacks until we go back to 100 organization and our morale recovers a little bit as well and our manpower at the same time recovers a little bit as well 
Seems like we did win this battle though at least, so uh, kudos to the uh, mighty Russian army. Huzzah! Only 16,000 dead and 25,000 wounded. Oof. Unfortunately, it is a little bit of a slugfest in this game when it comes to combat. It's all about the amount of units that you have if you have the same technology. If you have better tech, then it's a, it's really easy to win because the jumps in tech are massive. Look at that. Just because we have everybody on defense, we're crushing the French units when they try to attack us instantly, no matter what type of maneuver they might be using on us. They they do not stand a single freaking chance right there. Look at that, we're down to pursuit phase. Hot diggity dong. And we're inflicting a lot of damage. That's why I prefer to defend, usually until I drain the enemy army's morale. Once the enemy army's morale and manpower has been drained, that's when I attack. One of my personal favorite strats is to just always let the enemy attack you first, let them make the bad moves, and then after you push when they're weakened. Now take note, some very easy strats involve navally invading enemies, so you could say make a massive front with the enemy army and as long as they have fewer ships than you or no ships or just weaker ships you can send one of your navies to be fighting the enemy fleet and then in another node altogether use a secondary navy to do a naval invasion and there's a chance you can start a secondary front a third front a fourth front and this way you just have enough fronts that it collapses the enemy army's uh, organization and cohesion so you can essentially win the war very easy that is very situational and in the 1.5 update I have to say that they've improved the AI massively so you cannot really do naval invasions as easily as you could before. If you have some other advice you want to give other people in the community please leave it in the comment section. I always appreciate it. I love the game. I've been playing it like crazy especially couple last couple of months but of course I'm not perfect. There's a lot of other people that know the game a lot better than me but I do like to improve myself so one of the ways that I do that is by reading your comments and I do appreciate it you guys just making this community a better community altogether. Thank you for all the support on the channel and hey leave that like so we can do the economic video and until the next time check out my awesome japan run and i want to give a massive thank you to all of my patrons channel members and twitch subscribers i would not be able to do this without all your support